Welcome to the Andrew Holland Podcast, where we explore the stories of successful people, get insight and advice from individuals who have accomplished amazing things, and dive deep into understanding ourselves as human beings. Now, here's your host, Andrew Holland. Hello, everyone, and Josh, welcome to the Andrew Holland Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you're a partner with Ide Bailey. I am. And you are also the tax leader for the West region here in Phoenix. Correct. And you help clients navigate very complex tax issues and high net worth individuals, both businesses and high net worth individuals. That's right. That's right. So I want to talk more about that. And lately, correct me if I'm wrong, you've been specializing in mergers and acquisitions. Yep, that's fair. It's, uh, it's just part of the world today, right? We, uh, you know, our economy has gone through great boom. In the past, maybe 15, 20 years, uh, you have a generation that is uh, uh, going to retire, set to retire shortly. And there's uh, a lot of money that's sitting on the sidelines after you know what's happened in 12, 13, 14. Uh, the stock market is as high as it could ever be, quite frankly, in terms of you know where the world sits today. And uh, there's a lot of money on the sidelines trying to be deployed into something that's going to earn a rate of return for investors. And it seems like, uh, you know, real estate's high, the stock market's high, where else do we go? And you'll see, you know, big groups of money trying to go downstream really into middle America and pick up uh, these mid-market businesses. They've been very hot, um, very good cash flow, and it's just led to a ton of activity. Yeah. And we've had a lot of free money for the last 10 to 13 years. Absolutely right. right. And they have to do something with it. Yeah. So I want to talk about the economy, that concept of free money, where you think we're going. But before we get into all that, give us some background on you. Where were you born and raised? What was your childhood like? How did you end up in Phoenix, Arizona? Yeah. So it's a little bit of a a windy tale. Um, I was born in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, Didn't live too terribly far away from the beach. Um, my, My mother... Uh, took me back to the family farm in Montana as a as a 10, 11 year old. So I tell people I grew up on a cattle ranch in Montana, which is partly true, although I was the least cattle ranch cattle rancher <laughs> in the history of Montana. Uh, my grandfather, I think, had a picture of me with uh, Air Jordans and a baseball cap on backwards, you know, out doing ranch work. So, so you weren't uh, wearing the cowboy hat and the boots uh, and jumping on the bulls? Not then. No, 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 no. Not then. I was a hockey player. Um, and I really, you know, I really, really gravitate when I go back to Montana today. It's uh, it draws to me. It's home, right, for me. So, um, aside with the uh, ranch operations, there was a family construction company. So I grew up, uh, you know, doing a lot of the business operations work of the construction company, less running backhoes and more debits and credits in the business side of things. So I really always had this uh, uh, accounting, entrepreneurship, tax uh, consequences in my in my brain, and I do think you know even if we get down to this point another time in this podcast, I one of the uh, bedside manners that I think every professional should have when they're serving people is having to have sat on the other side of that desk at some point, right? Because you know uh, business advice is important, but it has to be understood by the client. That's critical to the relationship. And at the same time, you know, the advisor has to understand there's a human being sitting on the other side and what they're feeling when they're hearing the advice and and do they trust the advice? Do they trust the advisor? And that's critical. And I will tell you, um, the foundations in my family's construction company really uh, set the seeds for me sitting on this side of the desk now. And understanding that uh, somebody's hearing what I'm saying, somebody's going to write a check at the end of our conversation, and uh, it impacts them. Tell us about how that construction co- start company started. Was that your dad that started it? Your grandfather, and it, what involvement you had? Yeah, it was. It was my uncle started uh, a company way up in northern Montana. You know, uh, uh, it's probably a single piece of equipment and a pickup truck, and it really uh, it grew and grew into a, a, a significant construction company and you know through summers i would work doing odd jobs and then as i got older uh you know my mother was in the business side of things so i would uh you know go to work and just work on whatever project needed to be worked on and it again it uh it really set the stage for you know i'm just passionate as hell about entrepreneurs and 
people that risk virtually everything every day, um, you know, trying to trying to go into business and start a business and grow a business. And, you know, it's lonely at the top for a lot of them. They don't have people to, you know, that they can trust to chat with on a day to day basis, get advice from complain a little bit. Um, and that just again, that experience coming up through the ranks of my young career, uh, it really has has resonated in my mind. And, and it, it taught me more than most people will ever know. Well, I think you um, said it perfectly in the sense that a lot of people that are on the other side of business owners, as you said, until they've done it, can't really understand it. And I've can't been relate. in the, I, uh, they can't relate. I've been in the banking world. We have bankers do lots of transactions, whether private equity, VC, but they've never done it themselves. Yeah. And so uh, I'm sure that having that experience sets you apart from many other tax practitioners, CPAs, but that concept of being involved in your family's business, did you ever have the inkling to run it, take it over, or what ultimately ended up happening with the construction company? Yeah, it's still going today. It's passed on to uh, uh, another generation. I really didn't. And, you know, it, it was really outside of my skill set, right? If, uh, you know, if somebody says we're going to build a building, what I can't do is go vision. What's step one, step two, step three, right? I have some ability to go do a task that somebody says, go do task one. I have some ability to do that, but, you know, envisioning this is step one, this is step two. It really never was in my skill set. Now, you know, on the financial side of things, um, I can, I can envision that, right? I, I, you know, I can see pictures in my mind. Okay. This is step one. And if step one goes well, we can move to step two. If it doesn't go well, we have to re-engineer step one, the financial piece, you know, the legal piece that I, I can envision all that. I can't envision how deep does this hole need to be? Yeah. And what happens if it's not square? Well, it takes a great team to do it, right? People yeah. of all skills, strengths, yeah. and abilities. Did anybody in your family have uh, the CPA background or the finance side? Well, my mother, uh, you know, was a business consultant and really just a self-taught accountant. Uh, my father is a, uh, uh, a tax slash business lawyer in Los Angeles. So, you know, hearing, you know, the, the detailed technical analysis of, of very complex tax rules, statutes, uh, court decisions, you know, with just some of the practical blocking and tackling of business side of things really, uh, I didn't appreciate it till, till you know, re relatively recently that it, it's, uh, it's the perfect combination for me. So briefly, what brought you to Phoenix? Yeah, so uh, I, I graduated from college. Um, I'm a proud Gonzaga University alumni. Um, went off to work in, you know, my new career with my Superman cape and pocket protector <laughs> out to <laughs> conquer the world. And um, I ended up moving back to Montana, um, you know, the prettiest girl I'd ever met in my life, wanted to stay in Montana. So I packed up, moved home, um, uh, and I started my career at a, at a firm called Ide Bailey that I'd never heard of in Billings, Montana. And I sort of worked my way through, you know, the, the various long drudge days of the tax season, um, advising a variety of, of companies, you know, the advice you can give at the young level, but really, you know, experiencing as much as I could experience. And in 2007, um, the partner in charge of the Phoenix office gave me an opportunity to come down here um, and really take over the tax practice in the, uh, in the local market. And I said, you know, I'd love to, but, you know, good luck getting my wife to want to move to a big city. And uh, so they brought us down here, showed us the city. And uh, I think my wife started packing virtually immediately. So that was, uh, gosh, I can't believe this, but just about 17 years ago here in a couple months. So She made it easy on you. She did. That's she fantastic. Did. We were very fortunate. It's been fantastic for our, you know, we raised our two, our two sons here. It's been a terrific experience. You talked about the emotions of entrepreneurs. Yeah. And you've talked about them risking everything. You've worked with hundreds, dare I say, thousands of entrepreneurs yeah. over your career. What do you think sets them apart from other individuals? You know, um, first and foremost, I think it's the game of entrepreneurship for them, right? Um, you know, what makes a billionaire want 
two million or two billion and what makes them want three billion and it, it really has nothing to do with the zeros um there's virtually nothing that three billion can buy that one billion can't virtually nothing in the world so it's uh it's the game for them um they enjoy you know seeing a vision in the world attacking the vision creating whatever um needs to be created to do something and then moving on to the next piece right and that's uh some people play sports and some people play business and i think that uh you know the what i call a serial entrepreneur um it's just it's just what drives them it gets them out of bed right i need to do something you know to make this world a better place whether it's a service whether it's creating a widget whether it's um scaling the widget sales they see something like i talked about the vision of a construction company they see there's a market for this and it it improves them it gets them excited to to see that vision and create it and solve whatever's needing to be solved you said something that Many of my guests who have not been entrepreneurs, I haven't heard say, but it's clear to me that you have that experience of being in a family owned business. Mm -hmm. And you said it's very lonely at the top right? and they don't have many people to talk to. How do you know that? Just through talking with them, right? Um, you know, the, the advisor advisee relationship and whatever, whatever they're needing um, from a professional uh it's 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 this incredible level of trust this human connectivity that two people have right otherwise you're a service provider a vendor and you know part of part of growing up through the profession has been recognizing that again there's a person sitting there they genuinely want some help um most of them are type a control freaks and what i have what I've learned over time is they don't understand tax. It's complex as hell. They don't understand it. And that scares them that they are somewhat beholden to somebody to try and explain this concept to them. And they're a little nervous that they don't understand it. Right. And that's really outside of what's, what's allowed them to perform. Right. So if you can, if you can, you know, just accept that premise for a second. They're a little nervous that they're in this area they don't understand. And oh, by the way, it costs them a lot of money, right? When they when they're you know paying their tax bill or doing whatever they're investing in something. And you know, through through building the relationship at the at the human level with them and recognizing that you know they they're interested in the help, they'll take the help. They've got some some cultural background right tax is so intrapersonal to people you just never know how it's going to play yeah, out right? right there are pride from my cold dead hands people and there are you know this is a fair thing to do for society is pay our share of the tax and everybody's in the middle of that poll somewhere um for the most part but again if you you know if you can understand that relationship piece with another person who's an entrepreneur um they will slowly, you know, start to accept you into their team and their teams tend to be very small. Then when I say their team, I mean who they listen to and trust. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about my career now that's, gosh, it's just about 30 years old. Um, when an entrepreneur asks me a question, anything, investment, tax, whatever the case might be, um, most professionals will give you a series of things that are probable. They'll give you a series of results to each of the various avenues. And most of the time, the question that they're not asking, but the question really is, I understand my options. What would you do if you were in my shoes? And that's what sets apart good advice from advice is, what would you do if you were me? And I think, you know, part of the reason why my career has been, you know, somewhat successful is, I can get to that piece with the entrepreneurs. I can understand when they're really not asking that question and they really want some counsel. And it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different thing to tell somebody, no, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Or I hear what you're saying. Yes, we can do that. Here's the results if we do that because I've been through this transaction a thousand times. And oftentimes they'll get to the end of that and go, yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay, never mind. Right. That's. Uh, that's as much imparting education on them as it is, you know, trying to give them some technical answer. The the dark squad, right? Josh, you're good. That is that is <laughs> my 
favorite question to ask vendors or colleagues or employees when there's a problem? Right. What would you do if you were in my situation? Yeah, yeah and they'll take that. I mean, the, and again, when I say it's only at the top, there's not many people they would ask, what would you do? Mm-hmm. And really listen to mm-hmm. what they would do, right? And that's, uh, um, again, it's it's served me well. I think if you you know were to take a poll with some clients, that's one of the things that they uh, they enjoy it. But again, sitting on the other side of the desk, you know, thinking, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but I'm still confused. Potentially, I'm anxious about what the outcome of this decision is. Tell me, tell me, what should we do here? And that's uh, that's quite frankly why I got in the in the seat that I'm in professionally is because I'm I seek that conversation out. I seek that relationship. But it took a long time for you to get to that table, so to speak, a with a time. lot of your entrepreneurs. A long, a long time and a lot of heartache and sleepless nights worrying about, you know, some very, very technical question. And again, the technical question isn't the question, right? The question is, what should we do here? I want to get a little bit technical on exactly what you do and what you've seen. Again, going back to the concept, you pr- you primarily work at this stage in your career with buy and sell transactions. Is that fair to say? say That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Setting that aside, and we'll jump into that. When you sit down with entrepreneurs and you think about the expanse of your career, Mm -hmm. if you had to pick the top two or three tax implications that are deadly if missed, or you have seen be missed with very costly consequences, Mm -hmm. what would those be? Well, I don't know that I can really reduce it to two, um, but I'll, I'll just give you a general, a general one, we'll call it. Uh, I would submit this to most business owners, right? If you think about the income statement of your enterprise, right? I, the, the number one largest cost that most businesses have is, you know, cost of materials, cost of goods sold, right? It's typically the biggest, I take a product, I do something with it. That's a big cost. Number two, at least lately, is probably human capital, people, compensation, benefits. And if you really think, what's number three? I would submit to you and your listeners, it's probably tax, right? Tax is a big chunk that's taken off of, you know, every business owner's uh, uh, profit, every business owner's, you know, this economic accession to wealth. Tax is a big component of it, and you can talk a lot about tax policy and theory, but it's probably number three on most companies. They don't feel it because of all the very, you know, mm-hmm. hoops and speed bumps and hurdles. And sometimes it's low and sometimes it's high. But um, th- what I would tell you is most people think about tax as writing a check sometime quarterly at the end of the year. And there's something about writing a check that punches people in the face. But if you really, really dig deep into the third highest cost center on most people's business, you have to view it in three, four-year buckets, okay? Tax is a cost over a period of time, not a cost of writing a check or not writing a check, right? So if you, you know, people will make a tax decision in isolation and they feel great because they they don't owe the government any money. Well, there's a consequence to that decision two or three years down the road, right? And so when you're talking about tax and the critical mistake that I see very often is they're making a decision based on cash flow today, economically over whatever your period of time is, it's a, it's an awful decision. That's an excellent point. And I've seen that with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, particularly in capital intensive industries, Yeah, they'll buy this new equipment. And I remember one who was a real mentor uh, to my uh, previous business partner, Joe and I, uh, when we were in the trash services industry, continued to buy new equipment. <laughs> and we said, uh, buddy, when you sell, yeah. you are going to have some serious consequences. Oh, I know, I know. And I'm not sure he really knew. And then he sold and then he knew. Yeah, a bonus depreciation has been you know, around for 20 years. And it, it gets a little bit addictive to business owners, right? Because they're not writing that check today. And I've seen uh, transportation companies who are, you know, they have semi-tractor trailers and they're taking this heavy depreciation, which is saving them tax today, which, by the way, is what Congress intended by giving us that deduction is they want you to buy more, right? Mm-hmm. Well, you have to understand that the consequence of not writing that cha- that tax check today has a roll-off period over time. And if you get into a cycle where 
you know, used tractor trailers aren't worth anything anymore. You still owe the bank money. You're not getting an income tax reduction that's matching, right? The deduction is meant to match the, the principal payments on the debt. And if you're not bringing those down, you know, simultaneously, you could get yourself upside down very quick. There are companies that have unfortunately gone out of, gone out of business because they can't pay the tax and the bank at the mm -hmm. same time. You said something early on that tax professionals are very important, but it can be very expensive. For new entrepreneurs just getting started, they're already trying to figure out how to pay the bills, right. let alone now having an outsourced provider to take care of something that most of us don't understand. Mm -hmm. When do you think an entrepreneur or business owner should get a tax professional involved? Well, um, soon is the right answer, right? There are, again, there are different levels of tax providers, right? They're, and they're all Im critically important, right? There are very good tax preparers who do very complex tax filings, and, and most people start there. I just need this thing done correctly, and I don't need risk of something going wrong. That's sort of level one, right? As that business grows and, you know, we have more stakeholders, there's a, you know, there's families now that, that need this company to grow, you know, to, so that they can eat and pay their bills. There's a point where you cross over from, I need somebody to prepare my tax filings to, I need somebody to team up with me, partner with me to help control my tax cost. And that's really, that's a critical turnover point where you need more tax advisor than tax preparer. And, you know, tax advice is complex and it's risky. And, and it's what leads to the cost, quite frankly, because again, bad tax advice can be devastating to people. And so, you know, your company's going to grow, you're going to outgrow your providers. And I don't think that, you know, startup companies need high, high level, very expensive tax advice because the structure of their transactions isn't critically important. But there will come a day when that happens and they need to recognize that my tax preparer has been doing great work, but I've outgrown them. And I think that's when they need to start seeking some counsel. And based on your experience, and I recognize every company is different and every industry is different. For those listening who maybe feel they might be there, but they're not sure, what would you say, how would you base that based on a revenue range, based on a EBITDA range, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, mm -hmm. based on a net profit range, just to give some uh, of us a sense of you're at a point where you need not just a tax preparer, but a tax advisor. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think there's any metric that drives that decision, right? Because everything's relative, right? There, there are nine zero problems and three zero problems and somebody that's right at the inception of their company, a three zero problem may be critical, right? And, and at some point, a nine zero problem may be irrelevant to whatever's going to happen. So again, the crossover point in my mind is when the decision potentially impacts the viability of the company, okay? That's when you need to have counsel. That's when you need to talk to somebody that's been there, done that. Um, you know, they, are we going, are we going to invest in a in a separate line of business? Are we going to grow this thing? Are we just going to stay where we are and just be very good at this very small thing? Right. Um, at each of those points along the step, the critical thing for me again, understanding at least in my mind that it's the third largest cost center in most people's companies. When the decision becomes critical to the success of the business, I think you have to understand that somebody is very good at filling out a tax form who's incredibly useful, a lot of companies, they may not be the right person to advise you on, yes, let's uh, acquire that company, or let's just hunker down and grow this company because it's too expensive for you to step out and worry about running company number two when company number one needs you. If someone's thinking about starting or buying a company, based on all the different returns and all the transactions you've been involved, mm -hmm. Is there one industry over another that seems to have preferential tax treatment across the board? You know, um, 
every industry has a little bit of nuance in the code and it's 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 an interesting thing to sit back and think about you know really tax theory is meant to drive behaviors period plain and simple right our congress has has dumped into the social space and they're using our tax code to influence decisions and behaviors right so um, service businesses have special tax rules manufacturing companies tend to have different tax rules so if you can if you can think about the answer to that question being what is congress in, trying to incentivize the world to do right there was a period where we were going to manufacture and export our way out of financial problems so they gave a bunch of export benefits and they wanted you to buy construction equipment because they had big construction uh, manufacturing companies that were building equipment and they needed those to get purchased and they needed them to get sold offshore, so to speak. Um, I would say in today's world, anything that inquires, uh, that requires capital intensive purchases is probably going to end up with the, uh, uh, the most, you know, current day cash on cash income tax benefits, just simply through depreciation reductions, mm -hmm. right? That's, uh, that's a big thing. And, you know, our, our tax code is moving more to cash on cash, which is outlay of cash to reduced income taxes. And so when you, you know, if you can, if you can just think about that for a second, anything that requires heavy capital is going to probably get the, uh, the largest, you know, share of the tax uh, rebate, so to speak. With that being the case, why do you think our society is so infatuate, if infatuated with technology and service companies that are the exact opposite of what you just said? AI is the new buzzword for 2023 and 2024, and everybody wants to be part of AI and new tech company sure. out of San Francisco. Sure. Well, I think, you know, I think the technology, I mean, specific to AI, we, we can visit about that here in a minute, but specific to technology, I think, you know, our our business world was small at some point and people are recognizing that that the market for their company their services whatever they're doing is worldwide not county based or city based and i think technology is is allowing you know people who are doing very vital things for civilization to expand right so it my market now might be europe more than Phoenix, Arizona. And technology is what's allowing me to take this company and make it this big. So the investment in that is uh, is critical to the growth and even the survival of some companies. How old are your kids? 21 and 13. And what are their names? So my oldest, my 21-year-old's uh, name is Judson. He's a senior at Gonzaga right now studying mechanical engineering. Um, smartest kid I ever met. Uh, my 13 year old's name is Jonah. So we have all the J's in my family. Um, and he's, uh, you know, he's getting through a young hockey career and trying to get into high school right now. If Judson came to you and said, dad, mm -hmm. I want to start a company. You've seen thousands of transactions. You've seen, been involved in every industry. Yep. What should I start? What advice would you give Judson? So again, you know, there are products that people make that people buy because they need them. Um, I sit on my desk for a specific reason. I, I, I would tell him this, um, find something that people need continuously, regardless of economic climate, whether that's advice or whether it's a service of some sort. And you know, find a way to, you know, you know, grow this knowledge base and this service that you are going to perform for a variety of people, um, what, what, whatever that is, right? Engineering or accounting or law or whatever, human resource benefits, whatever that might be. Because I think that, you know, people, people, there's a fixed set of goods that people need in the world, right? But I do think that as the world grows and gets complex and business gets complex, that there's a really an unlimited amount of knowledge that people need and they can't, they can't become knowledgeable in everything. So they get knowledgeable in one thing and then they need somebody else to bring that knowledge to them. I would tell him some, start some type of a company where your knowledge is invaluable to people and find a way to get them to buy that from you. 
That's what that's what an accountant says, right? Uh, That's all people do is buy knowledge from me. (laughs) Well, but I think you actually uh, you said it very succinctly. Something that is non-cyclical, right, and will always be there and needed. And I think that's huge. What have you learned about culture in your interactions over the last thirty years? Culture. You know, the culture of business and its interactions on people, um, first of all, I think it's very easy to sell culture right now. I think it's very easy to put it in the brochure. Um, one of the things I am passionate about the firm that I work for, you know, we uh, we started in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, but that's a, you know, there's a different level of human relationships there versus some other you know, New York City or, you know, any any of the large cities. And, um you know, culture of, of when I think about culture, I think about trusting the process, trusting the people in their seats and really trusting them. Right. And if, if your organization can build a system where, you know, the, the leaders have a vision, the, the core group of, of employees understand that vision and the vision is connected through trying to get us to point B that culture where I have my role, you have your role, and but we both trust fundamentally that we're getting to the same point. Um, that's how I see culture right there, because I think people can feel that, right? People can feel that there's an alignment of goals between entrepreneurs and employees, and customers feel when those are aligned, and I think they want to be part of that, right? I think about why, why would I hire company A over company B? When I, when I look at company A, I think, you know, that is a team working towards some goal communally, not it's a profit center for somebody and it's just a job for somebody else. It's, uh, and so again, I say there's something happening inside of that organization that's attractive. I think that's culture. And when I can feel that, I'm interested in joining that for a variety of reasons. I mean, I just want to be a part of whatever that is because it's cool, because it feels good, because you have good results. And when I think about culture, I think about that, that common theme, that common goal, and you can see it, you can feel it. And when you see it and you feel it, you want to be a part of it, whether it's buying services from them or joining their team or doing, you know, doing some, any transaction. So humans are complicated. (laughs) We all have personal lives. We have professional lives. We have emotions. We have egos, we have confidence, we have overconfidence. Sure. I've been a part of organizations and I know you've uh, likely seen organizations through your transactions where that makes establishing a culture of, I don't want to say trust, but what you describe, two people each doing their own thing, but mutually working together mm-hmm. to achieve the same goal versus I'm going to step on top of this person so I can get to the top and this person's going to go behind this person's back yeah. and all the politics. Yeah, because I'm defending what's mine or some, some version of that. Yeah. How do you eliminate the very essence of who we are as humans, which create a lot of those complications within an organization? Well, psychology isn't my strong suit. It's uh, it's math, right? But <laughs> you know, um, I, I'm not sure you can you can you know reduce the the ego portion of it, right? But if you go back to an earlier comment where I talk about it's the game, it's not the end result, right? We we need things to survive. We have to buy groceries, and we need a car, and and yes, money, right? But the if we can understand organizationally that our goal is to do something for our stakeholders, stakeholders are clients as much as their employees, as much as they are owners, all three of those people have a stake in the success of that company. And if we can, if we can somehow get buy-in from all the stakeholders that going to that point is valuable, whether it's in dollars or whether it's in goal accomplishment, right. Or whether it's in success of something else, I think that takes the uh, the scorecard out of it, right? And most people see business. I, most people, you know, some people see business as uh, it's a scorecard. How much money did I end up with at the end of the day? I do think entrepreneurs, it's valuable to them, but I think the goal achievement is is just as valuable, right? Um, uh, an entrepreneur that I've worked for a long time ago, 
you know, he, he taught me as much as I taught him as, you know, he was on the other side of the desk and, you know, he told me, he said, most, uh, you know, most entrepreneurs have gone bankrupt a couple of times in their life and guess what? They're different and better people for that another day, right? When they're on company number three and there's a decision point, yeah, they might ask for my opinion, but when you've paced the house at three in the morning, trying to figure out how, how am I going to make payroll tomorrow? You're a different person, right? And that's when you can become a good business person in it, Again, in this person's advice to me, that's when you become a good business person. You're recognizing that it's more than you, it's families and it's clients that are dependent on you. And that in terms of getting everybody aligned and where this thing is going, I think that's critical. Josh, this is scary because you almost read my mind. That was going to be my next question about bankruptcy. I'm assuming you've seen multiple bankruptcies in your career. I have, unfortunately. Have you seen bankruptcies from one individual? that then went on to become a resounding success, secularly speaking? And have you seen bankruptcies where the individual was simply crippled and they never went on to accomplish something else? Well, I suppose it depends on how we define bankruptcy, right? If it's at the actual form of filing bankruptcy, but I, you know, there have, uh, you know, the oil and gas industry is what real estate is an industry where, you know, I mean, entrepreneurs are risk managers at their most basic level, right? And you win some and you lose some, right? But the ability to lose it all because the real estate market has crashed or the oil and gas industry has evaporated. I mean, literally, you know, everything is mortgaged, but I'm going anyway because I believe in whatever, whatever the, the, the industry is. I fundamentally believe in it. I understand it's cyclical. I have to be able to absorb downside Right. Because to celebrate upside, you have to be able to absorb downside. And most of the people that I would hold dear in my heart as being the great entrepreneurial minds that I've seen in my career have been through all of those cycles and survived them one way or the other. We're going to find a way to get through this one way. Attracting outside capital, gambling, you know, your, your, your home as collateral on something but they've found a way to make it work because they're passionate about whatever the industry is and whatever their goal is, they're going to get there. People that see a hot industry, they jump in, they have some debt, they have what, what investor money, but the hot industry, and they've only seen the upside, right? I, I worry about real estate people that are 35 years old and because they've only seen real estate go straight up. They've never had it be straight down. So every decision they're making as the market's going up is beautiful, but they don't understand that there's going to be a downslope on this one and they need to understand how to survive it. So I don't know that I answered your question, but again, what I would tell you is that the entrepreneurs that I value their opinion that I would work for someday are the people that have seen both sides of the market and found a way to survive. They're survivors in my mind. Why? I think it's it's the, it's that fundamental core DNA something in them that's going to get them to the other side. It's not about winning. It's about, I believe in this thing and I'm getting us there. And do you believe that's nature or nurture that has made them that way? I believe it's nature. Yeah, I think, you know, nurture is teaching and coaching and giving experiences and learning the variables. But but again, fundamentally, when that person's pacing their house at 3.30 in the morning. I, it, they're by themselves, and I think that's nature. There's an intrinsic drive to get there, figure this out. So you think it's genetic? I do. What would you say to all the people, and when I look at successes versus non-successes, the people who often achieve some of the greatest successes had the hardest childhoods and the most challenging upbringings, and they never had anything to lose, and they had to fight their whole life. And that's why they're the way they are. I, I, yeah. So I spoke to um, a client, no names, because there's confidentiality, of course. But, uh, you know, they were uh, an immigrant from the Middle East. And there, I remember them saying, you know, uh, if you failed over there, you, you, it might be the end for you, for your family. It's there was no backstop and when they came to the US, you know, and of course they start this thing, it grows incredibly, incredibly valuable. Right now, they have to say, now my kids don't have 
they don't have that built into them because almost nothing they can do can can lose what the family has built and passed on to the generations, right? So that becomes a parenting issue, right? How do I parent my child? Because every decision they make is going to be great because there's no downside risk, right? That's different than how they were, this person was raised. Um, again, that's why, that, I mean, that blends into nurture, which I understand, but there's, there's, you know, that first generation of wealth, they, they either are going to get there or they're not going to get there. Um, how much pain they takes them to get there, I don't know. But what I will tell you is, again, this is a very general statement, but many family businesses have been passed through the generations. Generation one idea struggled, grew a little bit, went backwards, grew a little bit, but somehow had success. Generation two typically would take that success and make it really big, right? Through technology is new. Now I can grow this thing to the world. Generation three, there's a few third generation companies that are going to listen to this that um, it's not in, about any of them, but generation three has the hardest job because typically speaking, they've never paced the house at 3.30 in the morning worrying about how I'm going to make payroll, right? Every decision they have is good or bad, but it's not devastating. Why do some of those companies fail and some succeed then? I just think they, I mean, I mean, it's the, first of all, markets are cyclical, so you just never know, right? But the the companies of those that fail is because when every decision wins, we keep making decisions that we intend to win. And if at any point in time, in whatever the cycle is, a handful of those decisions simultaneously lose, like they're going to over whatever your period of time is, um, that can, that can, crush a company that that has been going right so again you know founder starts small successful second generation grows that to the world now third generation is going to leave their mark or fourth generation is going to leave their mark and try and grow it bigger they might have outgrown exactly what has made them successful and that's where it's where you tend to get into some trouble we talked at the top of the podcast about the economy real estate interest uh um real estate market ever since I've been out of college, 2008, 2009 has been up only when mm -hmm. we had those great financial crisis. In the spirit of what you've been talking about, you know, there's a whole host of generation, dare I say generations that have only seen up. Right. Talk to us about where you think the economy is going. Do you believe that there are going to be consequences for our interest-free environment from the last 13 years? Well, there have to be, right? I mean, um, you know, we, the economy I think is, is being very resilient to what most people are predicting is going to happen. Um, I think personally, I think part of that has been orchestrated to keep it going, keep it on, keep it on the, on the rails, the way it is. Um, I've always viewed the economy as a car, the analogy, right? It's going down the highway at 60 miles an hour and somebody is going to have to slow it down and then speed it back up, slow it down, speed it back up. And the wheels and the engine are different components of the economy, right? I tell, I, as I talk to, to people about tax theory, I, in that analogy, I say, you know, the income tax code is the steering wheel, right? I, they have to try and make little minor adjustments while keeping this thing going straight. And if the car slows down, the steering wheel is less important. If the car gets faster, the steering wheel gets, you have to make more microscopic adjustments to not run that car into the ditch, right? Um, so again, I, it has to come back somewhere economically. Um, you know, I mean, we can talk about the social policy and printing money and all the things that you see and you hear, but at some point, somebody is going to have to pay, um, pay for the you know, the different components on my car, they're going to have to repair them, right? The engine is going to wear out. Somebody's going to have to, you know, front the cost of the new engine or the new tires or what, what new brakes, whatever the, whatever the, the story may be. And, you know, our, 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 our company, our company, excuse me, our country really only has one mechanism of raising money and that's income tax dollars, right? So I would say that 
if you can take the economy and just put it into the steering wheel, the income tax lens for a second, I think entrepreneurs are anxious about that cost and when it's going to sit down. That tax increase is coming. So a lot of discussions I have today with entrepreneurs, do I do that today or do I wait till tomorrow? Because tomorrow there's going to be a different cost of capital. Today, I know the cost. It's this. I don't know what it will be next year, and I don't know what it will be the year after that. But if we can assume that at some point that curve is going to go back up in terms of the cost, the cost of that transaction, I think people are trying to bunch things into periods of certainty in terms of their transactions. I know my answer today if I buy a piece of equipment. Um, now I need to understand what do I do with that piece of equipment relative to what it's going to cost me three years from now. Who's going to pay? Some generation of of people behind us. I, you know, it's whenever, whenever the economy slows down, when we hit the brakes on that, and I, again, I think the Fed's done a, a fairly good job of slowing this thing down. And then now it's going to try and speed it back up. We're going to run out of gas in this car at some point. Have to. I think populations are going to wane, right? If you think about the world population on a curve, it's plateauing and it's going to come down somewhere. Um, the generation where there's there's fewer workers to support the tax system, they're going to end up with a higher cost to them relative to their earnings, relative to their net worth. It's going to cost them somewhere. Might not be pure income taxes, but it's going to cost them. We have a debt of about $34 trillion in this country. Mm -hmm. Do you believe we can pay that debt without raising taxes? I don't. I'm not an economist, so I don't know the math on that one. But, um, you know, that again, taxes is the only revenue source that our country has, right? If you think about the income statement of the United States, most businesses, when they budget, right, a business that budgets, budgets for sales, and then they decide how they're going to spend it, right? I can give raises, I can take some profits, I can buy a piece of equipment, I can do retirement plans. Countries, when they budget, they do it in the reverse, right? They say, here's my costs, how am I going to raise the money? And as those costs grow, there's only one mechanism is to raise the revenue on the income statement of the United States. And there's only one way to raise the revenue, and that's raising taxes. What about the theory that if you can grow the economy and make it more robust by lowering taxes, you aren't increasing the tax rates, but you are increasing the nominal amount of dollars that come into the U.S. Treasury? Thoughts on that? Yeah, so you get to a static versus dynamic scoring, right, of 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 tax, right? So static scoring of a tax proposal is... There's a it's an arithmetic equation, right? There's a there's a cost and there's a rate and there's a result. Dynamic scoring would tell you, okay, but if I change the behaviors, right? Remember, our tax code is behavior controls and behavior inducements. If I can change the behavior, yeah, it's going to reduce the amount of money that I put in my pocket, but the amount of those transactions is going to grow, um, which will take the total higher because people are going to do things now based on the tax result. Um, you know, there was a, 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 there've been a few examples of that over my career. You know, there was, a, there's discussion of changing the capital gains tax rate, right? And if the, t- if the capital gains tax rate increases from 20 to 28, there's a bunch of people who wouldn't sell that are now going to sell so that they can lock in a, what, you know, what appears to be a lowered rate. And dynamic scoring would say, we're going to raise our total revenue because people who wouldn't do something are now doing something. So that's an example of, yes, it's a smaller rate, but we now have more transactions. And where do you fall with that philosophy? Well, I'm conservative by nature, unfortunately. So I I understand the math. What I think the philosophy lacks is who can predict how many more people are going to sell their sell their stock right so i get i get the concept and i think it works if i lower prices more people are going to buy the question that we have if you go back to our i'm trying to budget for how to how to cover these costs i'm trying to budget that how many more people i don't know and i think that gets tricky right because if i miss that number 
right? If I'm if I'm rate if I'm calculating my tax revenue based on what I hope is doubled number of transactions by lowering the rate, if I miss that number, I now have this huge deficit below the line just because people are tricky people and who knows who's going to actually do it, right? Who knows who's going to sell when they wouldn't have sold or or buy when they wouldn't have bought who knows if it's 10 or 50 or a million and if you miss that number you have a deficit somebody has to restore that at some point in the context of everything you've just talked about mm-hmm. why should people my age 40 or younger be optimistic what i've heard you say is we're at a 34 trillion dollar debt in this country the only way to solve it is raise taxes our populations are declining so that means if we're raising taxes we're raising it on fewer people, which means each individual has to pay more. Lots of generation, or there's a thought that given the current environment, Mm -hmm. some people feel they'll never own a house. Josh, what's there to be optimistic about for people 40 and younger? The 40 or younger environment, you know, they're, first of all, I think America is America. And I think we're going to find our way through this, right? Whether it's inventing technologies that takes us to an entirely different marketplace. Um, you know, I think our research and development here is unparalleled, right? I think that we haven't found all the good in the world. And I think the older than 40 people like myself that are dinosaurs or who are set in our ways predict doom and gloom. When I was 30 years old, I was talking to partners in my firm. They were like, you're an idiot. You don't have any idea what you're talking about. <laughs> now I find myself talking to young people going, what is happening? You have earbuds and your instant messaging, right? And this is happening. Um, so, you know, I have a 21 year old son. I'm excited for him because I think that while I worry about things and I pace the house and worry about making payroll tomorrow, I think that there's so much that your generation, the 20 year old generation, the 13 year old generation hasn't even created yet. That's what excites me. Um, they will, America's just going to incentivize them to get their way through this one way or the other. Yeah, there may be a higher tax cost. There may be a higher cost in terms of maybe there's less billionaires. There's two instead of 20, right? Because of the way people are going paying a higher burden is going to, you know, reduce your lifetime net worth potentially. And I just don't think that's a problem. Do you think as a society we've become soft? Uh, I, no, I don't. I think it's become different. Um, I think that you know, soft is really a subjective term. I don't think we've become soft. I think it's become different. We have to understand the world is a different place and a hard line versus a soft line is entirely different than it was 20 years ago. So I don't think we've fundamentally become soft. I think the problems have changed and the hard soft line has changed. You've been at Ide Bailey for almost 30 years, if not over 30 years. Mm-hmm. Unheard of in this day and age. Right. For, again, anybody 40 or younger. And when you look at the projections of how long people are staying at companies, it's real short. Yeah. Talk to us about that. So there was a, uh, there was a theory running around at some point that said, you need experiences. You need to go try this for a while and then move to that and learn something different and then move to that and learn something different. And the summation of all those experiences will turn you into a person somewhat, right? You'll be now be this sage business advisor, (laughs) right? You'll have cogent conversations with people and you will be brilliant only if you've had many different stops along the way, right? And I, I mean, there's, there's some truth to it, right? But at the same time, at the same time, if you're getting the day in, day out experiences in an environment that keeps me getting out of bed every day. The staff people that come into my company challenge me every day. The clients challenge me every day. I'm building my personal knowledge and brand and my self net worth. You can build that in one company. It's got to be the right company that you can build it in one. Do you think that the tax policy in this country has to be as complicated as it is? I do. Um, It's not a popular thought, but if social issues are going to be driven by the tax code, it has to be complicated, okay? 
So, so hear me out on this one. People say, well, why don't we do a flat tax? Understood, right? But remember, we have a series of expenses. We need to raise revenue. The arithmetic on that, the arithmetic on the raising of the revenue is very simple. It's a tax base times a rate yields a number, revenue. So we, the variables in that tax base, tax base is what is taxable, what is deductible. That's the highest expenditure that we have in the United States right now is income tax expenses. What's deductible? You can change the rate, which people read and hear about, or you can change the tax base, okay? You still need the number. You still need the yield, the product of that number to offset all the expenses. So my point is, do taxes need to be complex? If you go to a flat tax, you're going to have to adjust the rate a whole bunch up and down in order to yield your product. So what they're going to do is leave the rates static or down or up slightly and change the tax base, right? Those are the only two variables that we can control the revenue number. So anytime you get into what's taxable, what isn't taxable, what's deductible, what's not deductible, and you're into that, I'm going to change the tax base piece, leave the rates alone you're into complexity. I don't think it needs to be 70,000 pages long. I don't think we need bolt-on adjustments by Congress written in the margins. I don't think so. But again, you know, Congress is driving behaviors. I mean, we threw tea overboard in Boston, you know, uh, you know, protesting what's happening taxation without representation, right? That's our that's our country. And so if Congress is, is is into controlling the tax base, you're going to have some level of complexity. I wish it were easier. It would make my life easier if it were easier. But if it's some number times a rate gives you revenue, the what does some number mean is going to be complex. A lot of people say, I'm a CPA myself, mm-hmm. so the AICPA and the CPA Society and tax professionals are huge lobbyists to ensure that the tax system stays as complicated as it is. Otherwise, there's a whole lot of jobs gone in the CPA side. What do you say to that? Yeah, I disagree with that. Um, People people say to me all the time, oh, good good for business, right? You're always, the accountant's full employment act is is the way I hear that. And um, I'll tell you though, if you just get into my side of the desk, every complicating question every time they change a rule and it complicates the answer to the question it's higher risk for us okay i'll give you some some really interesting examples since 2017 our our code is has really changed to a bunch of permanent differences we used to say if i don't tax it today i tax it tomorrow we now have some provisions that if i don't do it right today i lose out forever and when when you're into those situations, you know, if you and I were sitting here talking about some, should I, should I deduct my new car I purchased, right? There was a time when, well, give it, you know, yes, because we're going to save tax today. As long as we don't give it back at a higher rate, you have a net win on the arbitrage. There are pieces of the tax code right now that weren't written by the CPAs. The CPAs are begging Congress to change it. They're begging the IRS to give us the rules on how we actually need to look at it. There are pieces of that that, you know, it's just it the risk on making the wrong decision, which falls somewhat on our tables, has grown substantial. It's stupid, Josh. Stupid. I, I, you know, I sit through, we all have to do CPEs. I sit through these EV credits and what they're changing and what's eligible and what you can do in your house. It's so asinine. Yep. It drives me up a wall. Now, take your average individual your business owner, or just an average individual, they're looking and they're sitting there. What are these idiots doing in Congress? This doesn't even make any sense. Right. From your perspective, what the heck is going on? Well, everybody's beholden to something, right? So but what I do think is unfortunate about the construct of our tax code, right, is they keep adding things to it, right? They just, <laughs> I, I, I need something. I, you know, I represent car dealerships and I need them to sell more electric vehicles because, you know, California has a rule that says we have to get cars within certain sets of gas mileage. So I need more of those sold. So they, they lop on top 
a, a tax benefit to selling more electric vehicles, right? That's a good thing. I think most people would say it's a good thing if we reduce our emissions and we have, you know, a, a growing temperature climate. And so let's do more electric. So they add this onto it. What they never do is pull back something else that was a competitor to that. So now what you have is you have people trying to understand this new rule and its impact on me. And you have me worrying about the rule that it should have replaced that's still with it. And you're coming to me saying, what should I do? And I'm like, well, I have to, I have to actually worry about both of those results, correct? So again, I, I do think there's complexity at some point. If you Again, if you can accept social, social reform is important using the tax code, the steering wheel of the car, I do think at some point they have there are some things in there that need to be removed when they insert something new. What they're doing today, what they've been doing for at least most of my career is they throw something on top and it works, but the complications that you feel when you get my invoice and it takes 22 hours and you think it should have taken me 12 minutes is because there's a bunch of old things in there that I have to analyze, understand, and worry about because I can't advise you properly once if those things are still a, a, a potential product of this decision. You've been very gracious with your time, so I want to shift gears and just ask you a few more questions. Being a business owner is a very emotionally volatile situation. You've worked with tons of them. How have you seen them deal with the inherent high highs and the inherent low lows that come with running a business? The high highs, I don't often see much it just because it's not the role that I'm playing with them, right? The celebrating of the high highs. Um, yeah, you're always coming to them and say, write this big fat yeah, check to Uncle this, Sam. Yeah, exactly right. I'm that guy. I'm check guy. Um, yeah. And it punches them in the face no matter what, yeah. right? But, you know, the the low lows, right? And I tell this, I tell this to young staff people, I tell this to colleagues and to clients. I say tax planning when you're in the high highs is a luxury. Tax planning when you're in the low lows is critical. You need to know the cost of some action. You have to know it. You have to plan for it because the, it's devastating if you miss it. And so again, what I have seen when you're in whatever those cycles are and, and just everything is, is getting beat, you know, beat whatever's happening. Um, entrepreneurs tend to be, I suppose, like most people, they, they're resource gatherers in their low lows and a cost and controlling a cost is critically important. Okay. So they will actually, from my experience, when they're in those low lows, they will lock themselves down with their team, their business team that they trust. And they will, you know, they will worry about very important, but maybe minute, but they'll worry more about important, important decisions. Okay. They'll worry about payroll. When everything's going up, if they miss one, they miss one and our efficiency is lost. Our profits might not be a hundred, but they're 96. Oh, well, it's a different day's problem. But when you're in, when they tend to be in the low lows of their life or their cycle, I will tell you, decisions now become critical and they will tend to, in my experience, rely more on those advisors and that team that they trust around them to help them get through, to help them get through. Most entrepreneurs don't lock themselves away at the low of the lows and just hunker down and wait for sun to come back up. They gather their team, they gather their resources and they make more, they get the Dremel tool out. They make much more specific important decisions rather than let's give it a shot and see what happens. Our society glamorizes entrepreneurism, technology, being a business owner, and it certainly has its advantages, particularly when you've worked hard and you've reached a certain level within a company. Mm -hmm. But we often don't talk about the other side of being a business owner, particularly when you're starting. And quite frankly, even as you grow, I remember I had one entrepreneur who said it was a lot more fun in the beginning. And now I have tons of families to figure out and things are tough and the market is shifting. Yep. Talk to us about the personal sacrifices that you've seen 
with your clients over the years to accomplish this incredible feat on the professional side. Yeah. So the joke I make, uh, you know, entrepreneurs are half-time jobs, right? And half-time meaning 12 hours a day, right? That's, <laughs> you'll appreciate that. Most, most business people that I work with make it look easy. Um, if we go way back in our conversation, we talk about nature versus nurture. There's some, there's something built into them that that's, that's what we have to do. We're going to work till this wins. I'm going to, I'm going to not see my family this weekend. Even, even in my career, I spent a lot of Saturday nights at the office, you know, two, three in the morning because the project needed to get done. So, you know, entrepreneurs have this, in my opinion, have this intrinsic, it, I'm going to work till this wins and money isn't the object, it's goal attainment. This, I'm, I'm going to put the weight of this on my shoulders and make sure it works. And as the company grows and there's more mouths to feed, there's more families reliant on you with that weight on your shoulders. I think, I think on, at some point you feel it. At some points the weight gets big. You've grown, you've grown, you're successful, you're in Forbes magazine, right? But at some point they realize there's 10,000 people trying to make their house payment. I still have the weight of the, I'm, I'm still making this win just by my own will. And that, that weight gets heavy. And I told you it's lonely at the top when we started. And I think that that, you know, they feel it at some point and they're just not going to give up. And that, uh, that can ruin people. Is it worth it? Well, I sit on my, I sit on my side of the desk for a reason, right? It's, it, it has to be worth it or I don't think they would play the game. But you yourself have said you've spent many Saturday evenings at the office because a project has to get done. And I asked this in the context, I just had a very, very dear friend and mentor pass away this morning. Oh, oh gosh. And I once asked him, he was 77, 78. I won at, once asked him a couple of years ago, we did a few business deals. This was back in Wisconsin. Um, Steve Pregent was his name. When's enough? And he said more. And it was typical Steve, yeah. uh, hilarious, just just a really fun, loving guy. And a year or so later, he got cancer. And I kind of asked him a, a similar question, but not really in the same, quite as direct. Yeah. Um, and you could tell that he had certainly recognized the he was very content he seemed very content at that point because life circumstances changed mm -hmm. talk to me about the transition you see entrepreneurs go through as they start a company the company grows big as they're passing on to the next generation i've always thought about it's a whole mental trend really life is a mental transition right, right or right, is an right, experience right. but from that perspective uh talk to us about what you've seen for business owners that transition and what it looks like what's interesting is uh i don't see it ever really turn off right it's it might change it might look different but it doesn't turn off right so entrepreneur starts a business they grow they sell it for some untold amount of money and they wake up the next day and they have a the savings account balance is you know they check the balance and yep it's still there but it it doesn't turn off that drive they have to do something um oftentimes they'll go do something else right but um i don't think that Again, if you can accept my premise that it's nature versus nurture, I don't think you're going to turn that drive off. I think they learn to live with it, um, but I don't think you're going to turn off tinkering in the garage all night long. Whether they invent something or not is not the issue. It's it's the drive to do something that's positive and beneficial for the world. That again, I think when the company sold or transferred to the next generation, they always tend to, you know, hover and say, I can't play golf all day. I have to do something and trying to figure out what the something is. I don't know how to do that, but I do see most of them, most of the entrepreneurs that have been through those stages say they missed the game. Um, I'm a big fan of hockey 
big fan of hockey. Um, I've been very blessed to know many retired NHLers out in Scottsdale. And the common theme with them is they don't miss the sport. They miss the locker room with the guys. And that's, they, they can't ever replace it. I think an entrepreneur doesn't necessarily miss the HR meeting or renegotiating the lease, <laughs> right? But they miss, they miss the people. And again, I, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but I, I, I don't think you can turn that off. I think they learn to adjust their, just their energy somewhere else, but I don't think they ever turn it off. Anything else you want to share with our listeners that we haven't already talked about, Josh, that you think is particularly important or anything of, uh, anything you want to share? You know, um, I suppose not really, that's a really broad question, but what I would, what I'd tell people, if we can just go back to the M&A space quickly, I know it's important to entrepreneurs, right? Because that's a life-changing event to monetize their baby. And the, the conversation that I have invariably with every client is you've, you're a risk manager by definition. You manage risk all day, every day. That's what a business owner does. And you've been operating your company very successfully, but you've been operating your company with a given set of goals and oftentimes trying to reduce the income tax burden. You've been running your company under a given set of rules to reduce tax. I'm running my cell phone bill through the company. I'm buying a new truck because I can take depreciation expense. I'm, and as you start to look out in the, in the front of windshield of the car and say, I'm thinking about an exit. You have to change the way you've been operating to get yourself ready for a transaction, right? People that are on the buy side, they want to see certain metrics, results. They want to see the quality of your business. They want to see the sufficiency of your earnings. And yet you've been operating it the whole time to try and pay no income tax. You are at competing ideals there. So moving from I've been running this to reduce taxes to I'm trying to show a ton of viability and profit. You have to get out in front of that quick because if you don't, if you always run that company in a way that's reducing taxes, so to speak, you're going to very likely pay for that in term, you know, somewhere reduce sales price or, or extra set aside or, or escrow amounts or something out on that transaction. So the advice I would tell your listeners is this. If you're going to transact your company, you have to change the way you operate because the old rules don't apply, new rules do. And you need a team to help you establish those new rules and help you soften that conversion from one to the other. And how many years in advance would you recommend that you change the rules of the game that you've been operating under before to the extent you have control you participate in, let's say on a sell transaction? Well, there's no, there's no number. I mean, the right answer is as soon as soon as you can. Um, you know, most, again, it's, it's so dependent on what the business is, right? And the, most companies are looking for a revenue stream, right? And so when we talk about what they're going to pay, what a buyer is willing to pay, we talk about EBITDA, which you talked earlier about, and we talk about a multiple, and the, the analogy that I, on the multiple that I've used historically has been this, the multiple, 10 multiple, nine multiple, whatever it is, the multiple is representative of the amount of time it would take the buyer to go across the street, set up, a, set up an identical business, and how long it would take them to duplicate what you've duplicated, okay? So again, understanding that People are getting calls by the weeks. Can we buy your company? If you set that aside for a second, if you're going to demand a seven multiple for your company, let's just say it is, you need to be far enough out in front of that transaction because the person paying you the multiple is trying to decide, can I duplicate what you've done in seven years conceptually? Yeah. So no, I don't mean you have to go out seven years, but the farther away you can mm -hmm. get from it, the better their number is going to be where they're saying, I can't duplicate that in seven years. I, I better buy you or I'm going to pay you not a seven, but a 10 because whatever you've done, this secret sauce, this thing that you've done, I really need it. 
and I need to take it out. I, it, I can't build it that fast. So time cures all evil in the business world, in my opinion. Um, you know, people say, well, we're, we're going to look at three years trailing. Yeah, I totally understand that's the product. That's the arithmetic product. But what they're really fundamentally analyzing from you is how fast would it take me to duplicate it? Because if I can do that in less than seven years, I don't need to buy you. If it takes me more than seven years, I'd be better off to buy you or your company. And the further away you can get from that point in terms of showing them the real impact of this company, the higher you drive your multiple. That's incredible advice, Josh. You just described it in a way that anybody, business or non-business, can understand. If someone's going to pay you seven times what you earn in one year, there has to be a reason. They can't duplicate that in seven. We just picked a random multiple of right, seven. For sure. But if you're earning a hundred dollars and you're asking for seven hundred dollars, the the person buying you better be able to say, Well, if I wanted to duplicate that seven hundred dollars, it will take eight or nine or ten years. So exactly. It makes more financial sense for me to do it now. That's right. If I can duplicate whatever you're doing because you're, I can't see you're, you're running your business to be efficient. If I can duplicate that in three years, I'm certainly not paying you seven. I could just ask you a million more questions on that one thought, but I'll end with this. On that duplication, mm -hmm. do you see any particular areas where competitive advantages are given greater multiples than simply your bare bones operation all the time right and what are those yeah i don't know what the competitive is again it's industry specific but again as a general thought and my wife teases me because i talk in parables so i tell a story hoping you get the concept of it right but you know, a, uh, a financial buyer is buying a rate of return, period, right? They are going to engineer the calculation to get the highest rate of return for their investors. End of story. They don't care what you do. It's a little exaggeration, but they don't care what you do. A synergistic buyer, which is a, a competitor, a, a space, I mean, that we're in the same space. They oftentimes will pay a premium because they're buying the competitive advantage. And I'm, I'm not sure what it is, but let's just say they're trying to take a competitor out of the marketplace, right? Um, it isn't uncommon for me to look at a business valuation. Some some professional said, your company is worth $100. There's a competitor in the space that they either want your secret sauce, you figured out how to do IT and they haven't, you figured out how to how to scale your salespeople and they haven't, but they're pretty good at some other things. They're just not as good at that. It wouldn't be uncommon for them to pay double what a financial buyer would pay you because they're actually buying that, whatever the competitive advantage is. Um, and sometimes the competitive advantage can be, I'm tired of competing with you, right? I think I'm pretty good. I'm running up against you constantly. I'm tired of it. We're driving each other's price to the bottom. So I tell you what, Here's some money, go away. I'm exaggerating. I don't mean it mm -hmm. exactly like that, but if we're, we're better off as as one than we are fighting against each other. So again, when you talk about multiple, it is quite common in a synergistic buy sell transaction, and people call it different things. You know, synergistic is the combination of two things that make it better. In a synergistic acquisition, I would say it's quite common to see a multiple significantly above a financial transaction. And are you seeing more financial transactions as we sit here in 2024 or more synergistic transactions given the cost of capital where it is now it, it, or 50-50? What are you seeing there? Yeah, it's probably more 50-50. It, it, it's, it's an interesting blend. Okay, so if we could just say private equity is deploying capital to buy a rate of return. So they're a financial buyer. They're a financial buyer. But what, they, what they're doing or what I'm seeing now is they buy company A. And now they're a financial buyer with respect to company A, but then they back, they financially back company A buying synergistic company B to make one plus one four. So they're a financial buyer, but the transactions, what the multiples are and the synergies are, it's, it's almost two in one transaction. There's a financial person up here worrying about internal rate of return. And then these two companies combining to make one plus one four 
that's a synergistic acquisition and you're almost blending the two. I, it's closer to 50, 50, but what I'm seeing now is a bunch of private equity backed synergistic combinations. So if I wanted to, can I come to you, Josh, and say, okay, I want to buy two companies and I want one plus one to equal four. You can tell me what to do. <laughs> You'll tell me what companies to buy. Hey, if I could do that, I, I wouldn't be, uh, I would be somewhere drinking something out of a coconut today. Not, uh, <laughs> not heading to work. Uh, last question, I promise. If Judson came to you and said, Dad, I want to start a company. Should I start my own company or should I buy a company? Your advice would be? My advice would be start a company. If we take the, if we take the financial consequence out, start a company, be your own boss, live your dream, follow your passion. Um, Simon Sinek wrote a book called Start With Why. Tell me why you want to do this and if your why is reasonable and it's it's intrinsic in your dna it's nature it's in your nature start a company be your own boss dream your own dreams you know create your own goals because that's what's going to keep you on this path to the end start your own company and be your thing josh thank you so much thank you really appreciate it enjoyed it thank you thank you for listening to the andrew holland podcast Never miss an episode by subscribing to and liking our YouTube channel, The Andrew Holland Podcast, and by following and liking the show on your favorite audio platforms. Be sure to connect with us on X, formerly Twitter, A Holland Podcast. That's A Holland Podcast. So you can interact with Andrew, the team, and our guests throughout the week. Thank you again so much for listening. Have a great day, and we'll talk again soon.